I'd like to start by saying I have to hold the mic. I'd like to start by saying a tremendous thank you uh, to the hosts, of course, um, for doing this and running this wonderful, wonderful program, and uh, uh, as well to a uh, incredibly tenacious Rebbitzin, Rebbitzin Fuchs. <laughs> I don't think Snowden was put under as much pressure as I was. Um, but Baruch Hashem, to a tremendous cause. Today, today we, we walk in, we enter into a month, a period which begins the time, the Yimei Adin V'arachamim, the high holiday season is approaching, and although normally Rosh Chodesh fills a person when you're singing all the wonderful tunes, it fills a person with so much joy and simcha, I always felt that Rosh Chodesh El was a little bit different. Because you're singing the Hal, and you're getting excited, and someone picked the right tune, and it's wonderful. It wasn't one of those awkward moments when the cousin chose a tune that only they know, and they try and soldier on until eventually they change it. Even if you had an incredible, amazing hollow, you know that on the other side of Rosh, on the other side of this Rosh Chodesh, the games are over. The period begins when a person gets literally dragged through the court system. Every single action that they've done, every thought, every word is weighed on a scale. And Hakadosh Baruch Hu, up in heaven, with his Pamalya Shalmala, with his heavenly court, decides whether we are worthy of another year. That is a petrifying thought. I mean, I don't know, maybe you guys are perfect, but for me, it's terrifying. And however good you are, you don't get out because you were good. HaKadosh Baruch Hu's medaktik says the Gemara in Matzadikim, Kichut HaSairo. So you got better? No problem. The din shifts, and now we rule and we check you on a higher madrega so that there's still a pachad and an aim of fear of the din of the judgment. Who knows? Who knows what sits on the other side of this Rosh Chodesh wonderful day? And it's a day that fills a person, at least a person who is thinking, at least a person who is aware of what he's going through. It fills him with dread, it has to. And I often think that in my line of work, when I meet people who are unaware of this, I work extensively in the, in, in the cure of world, and people are not aware of it. They don't know what it is that they're going through. As far as they're concerned, these high holidays is just a time when you go, with the two, three days that you go to shul, you meet all the people that you haven't seen in a year, you wear something you hope you look nice in because that's your last shot to impress them for the year, right? It's even sadder. Even though they're not afraid, it's even sadder. Now, it's a time of great pachat, and I always like to share this story to just kick it off. I'm Safari, although I don't look it, I'm undercover. <laughs> my mother is Ashkenaz, my mother's from Germany, my father's from Syria, which is perhaps a story for another day. But what wound up happening in this intermarriage <clears throat> <laughs> what wound up happening is, is that we adopted all of the Sephardim and Hagen. It was brilliant. Um, one of the Sephardim and Hagen for Rosh Hashanah is that instead of having a fish's head on the table, we have a sheep's head. I know some Ashkenazim have since adopted this in their anti-pescatorian, uh, you know, stances. But um, we put this, you know, this giant sheep's head on the table. And I remember, um, as we take it out, I'm a little bit crazy. Um, you only don't realize that because you don't know me. Well, I'm, I'm actually certifiably insane. And what I do is I always, I, I like to try and wake these things up for my kids. So I have this bit where I'll take the head. It's a giant actual head. You can see it's basically, so I take it off the table and we do like, you know, we talk with it. You know, they missed me on Pesach, but they got me for Russia shot, stuff like that. You know, and basically we're talking and all the kids, and ask my wife, because we're bringing the, the head of the sheep on the plate down to the table, so my wife notices that the sheep, the teeth are in all their glory, they're nice and brown, from all the wonderful, sorry if anyone was planning on eating sheep's head this morning, I just didn't think it was that likely. So there's like brown teeth and they're kind of all, and my wife thought, what a great teaching moment. She points towards the head, she tells my daughter, Shoshana, she says, Shosh, 
You see what happens when you don't brush your teeth and my daughter says, they chop off your head. <laughs> so the Yom and Meroim, they, they are awesome and fearful days. And when someone doesn't understand them and they think that it's just a bunch of simonim, that's even sadder because they don't get this great weight that hangs over them, the great opportunity that they have to change and influence the lives of themselves and their entire families around them with a few short tefillahs, with some sincere teshuvah. Rav Shimshin Pincus was a fantastic, fantastic, fantastic Tamil a godol, a mashkiach, an educator. And one day he's walking in his yeshiva, and he needs a safer on Rosh Hashanah whilst he's practicing, whilst he, he goes upstairs and he opens up the door to the library and he wants to get a safer. All of a sudden someone's moving around. He runs up to this person and he sees that there's a boy hiding in the corner of the library. It's the middle of davening. He says, what are you doing? And the boy says, I'm so embarrassed. I know I set my alarm. I told people to wake me up. But I woke up. I was two, hour, two hours late for davening. I can't show my face. I can't walk in. So I've been sitting here in the library. And if Shimshin Pink is told him the following story, and this is what I'd like to begin with. He says, what do you mean? He says, I'm embarrassed. He says, let me tell you a story. During the War of Independence in Eretz Israel, there was a soldier who got injured. He had shrapnel in his arm and his leg. It's incredibly dangerous. My mother served in Shari Tzedek. And she would tend to soldiers that were coming in literally torn apart. My mother confirmed this is how it works. So the soldier comes in and he's sitting there, he's injured and he's bleeding and, you know, and they've given him this anesthetic to try and you know, suck, give, take away a little bit of the pain. And as he's sitting there and, and they're removing piece by piece by piece by piece, sewing up the holes, creating bigger ones to get out pieces that are gone, the guy keeps asking, are you done yet? Are you done yet? And this, the nurse and the doctor, they feel you know, this person, they can't handle any more pain. So they say to him, you know what, it'll be done in just a minute. In just a few minutes, he keeps saying, are you done yet? Are you done yet? And he feels so bad, the guy wants to lie down, he wants to go back to sleep. Leave him alone. A few moments, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Until finally they say, yeah, we're done. And they expect this guy to lie down. And he throws his legs over the side of the bed. And he starts walking out the door. And they say, what are you doing? Where are you think you're going? And he grabs the rifle that he came in with, and he throws it over his shoulder. And he starts walking down the corridor, and the doctors and the nurses are telling him, you've just had multiple major surgeries. You can't go out. You can't go anywhere. You need to sit down. You need to rest. And he says, rest? We are at war. I don't have time to rest. Yeah, you took me out for 10 minutes to patch me up, but now I need to go back. He turns to this boy and he says, you missed two hours, but you are at war. You need to fight for something. We are fighting with Hashem to give us more time to enhance the time that we have, to give someone the help that they need, to fix Parnassah, to fix the rifts that Sholem is literally it's so, it's so lacking in Kalal Yisrael. We are at war. We are at war with the Midas Hadin. What we deserve and what we want are radically different things. We deserve nothing. But we want so much. We want so much from our Kodesh Baruch So much that we don't deserve. So much that we cannot justify. With our Mycin, with our Torah, with our Tefillahs. We're just not good enough. But we want more. So we go to war, so to speak, with Hashem. And Repikas brings the most amazing story. He came into his house one year on Purim, and he's dressed up from head to toe in a bear costume. Of course, kid, right? He sees what's going on. The kid is so afraid. He sees there's a bear at his front door. How often does that happen? So he opens the door, and he's, the kid is, is frightened. Now the dad, Rapinkus, realizes that his child is so afraid. So he says, Tatele. You know, it's me, it's your Tati, it's your Abba. Come, come here, let me give you a hug. Let me hold you close and the child hears the voice of his father emanating from the bear. The bear. Says Rav Shimshin Pinkus, we say in the tefillah on the Yom Noiron, Mimecha Eilecha Evrach. Who are we running from? 
Hashem. Whom are we running to? Hashem. Hashem, when he wears this cloak of din, it's so frightening. But it's him that we're running to. Mimcha elecho evrach. So if we're trying to understand what it is in the process that we're supposed to do with acquiring truth, with acquiring a year for ourselves that we can be happy with, then we need to understand what our job is, what our avoid is, and what, most of all, what our perspective is. So let me try and give this idea over as an, uh, uh, as an example. Psychologists tell us today that most of what a person does in this world are built on top of what they call maps. Let me give you an example. If, God forbid, a person is abused by their father, and you say the word dad to them, what's the first image that that word conjures up? It's not trust or security or safety or money, if you're a Jewish princess. Yeah? It's not any of those. What's the first word that comes to his head? Fear. He's afraid of his father. If a person, I remember once I was giving a class on marriage, and one guy in the back, he's a bit of a joker, and he says, he raises his hand, and I, I, didn't know, I didn't know the kid yet. So he raises his hand, and I said, yes, and he says, Rabbi, what does wife stand for? I didn't know what he meant. He said, washing, ironing, folding, etc." <laughs> I said, please promise me one thing. Promise me that you'll never, ever, ever get married. Because a person, the way they live their life is built around their definitions. If that's what you think your wife is going to be, you're going to suffer. Because what happens when you realize that she's a person? She's your equal, she's not your servant or your slave. Suddenly, your entire concept of marriage begins to break down. She's not giving me what I want. That's what I got into this for. The definition that a person has for any word, for any topless, that is what drives the way he attains that thing. And I think one of the biggest problems that we have is that we do not have correct definitions in our lives. It's not, so to speak, sometimes we would do what we needed to do if we only knew what to do. How many times has that happened to you? You just wish you knew what to do. You're raising your kids, and the kid is a chutzpahdika kid. So on the one hand, all the parenting books on the one side of your brain are telling you, you need to give him more space. You need to just show him love. You don't, don't tell him what to do. And the other parenting books are yelling at you, boundaries, children love boundaries. Tell him that he can't. Do you understand? You, you would do what you needed to do, however difficult it was, even if they would tell you that they hate you. But I just don't know, I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do, clarity. If that's not one to daven for on Rosh Hashanah, everyone's busy davening for life, clarity. Definitions are what is missing in our lives. All of Torah instruction is meant to convey this concept. It's meant to help us define what is chesed. What are the boundaries of that word? What is faith? What is emuna? Where do the beginnings and end of hishtadlus lie? When am I fooling myself when I'm telling myself, oh, I'm just doing my bit, and when am I trying to play God? Definitions. That's all of Torah, definitions. And once I have a definition, then I can work on it. So I'd like to talk about the definition of teshuva, the concept of what teshuva really, really means. Because if you have the wrong shot, the wrong idea in teshuva, as hard as you try, you're never, ever, ever going to get there. Because you're running after the wrong thing. Teshuva in most people's head means repentance. Classic. And I'm sure many of you have heard this idea that teshuva doesn't mean repentance, it means to return. But I'd like to understand exactly what that means. So much of the misunderstanding and the misinterpretation of mitzvahs that we have in our lives can be boiled down to and attributed to the fact that we translate Lashon Kodesh into English. Lashon Kodesh is a very nuanced language. And if one was to study the works of the Maharal, you'd find out that every single word, when it has different layerings, and one word means three different things, all of those things intertwine to provide you with one definition. They might mean radically contrasting things, but when you hold these three definitions, a simple example, last week's Parsha, 
Tzedek, tzedek tirdev. Tzedek means justice. Seek justice. Simple idea. Seek justice. But tzedek, tzedakah, doesn't only mean justice, it also means righteousness. Now technically those things, they are parallel opposites. What a person deserves in justice is the opposite of what he deserves with kindness. Justice means, no, you don't deserve it. Kindness means, I'm going to give it to you anyway. How can the same word mean most things? And that idea, those two, those two parallel interpretations, when held up together, help us understand that true justice has to be compassionate. And if it is not, it is unjust. So let's try, let's try and take this word teshuva apart. Now when a person does something wrong in their lives, and we all have, and I'd like to just throw out there that we're so obsessed on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur with the things that we've done wrong, we forget to think about the things that we haven't done right. Our alchet, I said Rosh Hashanah, I didn't keep Shabbos properly. I didn't do this, I wouldn't do that. I didn't go as much as I should. Did you ever wonder that perhaps Hashem is a lot more concerned about what you didn't do than what you didn't do? What you were supposed to accomplish rather than the things that you messed up? Of course there's a din on both of them. But there's so much more. The Pesach tells us that Shmuel's mother brings him to Eli to bring him up as a wonderful tzaddik, as a god of Adar. And he comes in and he's a child and he's perfect. And one night, in the middle of the night, Shmuel wakes up and he hears a voice calling him, Shmuel, and who is it? It's Hashem. Hashem is calling on Shmuel to be the next Navi, to be the leader of Kalal Yisrael. Shmuel, Shmuel. Shmuel's a young child. He's never heard Hashem before. Who does he think is calling him? Eli and he runs up to the next room, he says, yes, Eli, yes, my Rebbe. And Eli looks at the kid and he says, like Harasi, I didn't call you. Shushachav, go back, lie down. It's a mistake, you were dreaming. And the kid goes back and he lies down. And again, what does he hear? Shmuel, Shmuel. He gets up, runs in, Eli, I heard you this fight for sure. Eli says, no, it wasn't me. Shushachav, go back and lie down. Go lie down again. He goes back again and he lies down again. Shmuel, Shmuel. This time Eli understands that Shmuel is not hearing his own voice. He's not hearing a voice in his dreams. He's hearing HaKadosh Baruch Hu call after him. And what a powerful lesson I heard from Rav Bogomilski. This is us every single day. Hashem is calling. He's saying Shlomo or Yitzchak, or Rivka, or Sarah, 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 he's waking you up. And you turn around and you run, run to somebody, you ask for direction, they say, no, no, there's nothing. Don't worry about it. It's not your fault. It's not your problem. It's not your responsibility. How many times have you heard those words? Shuv shechav. Go back to sleep. We've heard a call we know we're supposed to do, we know we're supposed to be, and sometimes it's not in the form of a voice, it's in the form of a feeling. We feel empty, we feel as if there's so much more that we could contribute, but there's no space for me. Rebbe Fuchs is too good. There's no space for me, they don't need me. If they didn't need you, they wouldn't have made you. Hashem doesn't make mistakes. Hashem is calling. Sora, Rivka, Leah, Dina, whatever your name is. He's asking for you to be something. He's giving you and granting you life this year so that you can be something. So that you could do something that only you could. But either us or our leaders or our families or our spouses or our children, they tell us, Shuv, Shechav, go back to sleep. Got to eat in another restaurant. Go shopping. Don't worry. Go on vacation. Go back to sleep. That, for me, is what Rosh Hashanah, more than anything else, is about. Yom Kippur, perhaps, is about the Averis in a greater level, but Rosh Hashanah is about making our Kodesh Baruch the king of the whole world. And each soldier and each minister has their place. What is your place? 
Now, all of us have heard this idea that El was represented by the Pasuk, Ani l'doidi v'doidi li, I am to my beloved and my beloved is to me. It's a time of closeness to Hashem. Hashem is willing to welcome us back. He's willing to forgive our mistakes and He's willing to have us again serve Him. He's willing to give us the time, the resources to serve Him again. You're all familiar with that. But the Balatunim explains a very different idea. The letters of Ani L'doidi V'doidi Li, they represent something else entirely. Those letters, El, are also the same letters that spell the word Lule. Lule means, if only, Lule Seiros V'shashuai. If only, if at, without the Torah, without that, Lule Hemanti, if only I could believe. The concept of El is, if only. If only I wasn't so selfish. If only I wasn't so sensitive. And I didn't mind that people told me I was doing the job wrong. Maybe I would do the job. If only I wasn't so afraid. If only I didn't feel I'd be rejected. If only Lule. If only I could be the person. And I know, says Hashem, that there's a better a bigger, a more bold, a more exciting, a more energized you living inside of this body. Show me yourself, says Hashem. Show me. I want to give you more. But show me you're using what I've given you already. <coughs> In Davening on Rosh Hashanah, we say, Ashrei Ha'om Yoidei Teruah. Praiseworthy is the people that know the Teruah. <laughs> the, the Gemara already explains this idea. Amen. The Gemara already points out that this idea, Yoidei Teruah, you would have thought it should say, Praiseworthy the people. Shoime that hear Teruah. What does it mean, Yoidei Teruah, that they know? They know the true. So one of the teachers I was working with in England, she told me that she was in Eretz Israel for the Gulf War. And they'd arrived, and they didn't have a chance yet to brief them on everything they needed to do. And this young teacher, she's without the students at that time, the students are coming in a few more days. She's sleeping, and all of a sudden, woo! Bolts out of bed. Jumps out of bed. The siren's gone off. And then she realizes, with crushing frustration, that she has no idea what she's supposed to do for the siren. Do you run outside, or is that worse? What do you do? Was she supposed to, she supposed to put something on her face, or is that going to choke her? She has no idea. Do you know what this girl did? She went back to bed. She had no idea what to do. Ashrei ha'om yoit eiteruah. We'll go to shul. We hear the shoifer. We'll hear the call. Not just of the shoifer, but of our own conscience. Our own conscience telling us it's not enough. You are not enough. You can be so much better. But we don't know what to do. So what do we do? We go back to sleep. Shuv, shechav. Go back and lie down. Don't worry, it's a bad dream. It'll disappear in the morning. It'll disappear. It's okay. What do we need to do? So I'd like to talk to you about two words in English. Mistranslation of the word teshuva. The word teshuva is translated, like we said, as repentance. And it doesn't mean that means return. So let's take two English words that are used interchangeably. They think, people think they mean the same thing, but actually they are radically different. Those two words are guilt and regret. We feel guilty about what we did. We regret what we've done. They're similar words, right? But actually, they could not be more different. Let me explain the difference between guilt and regret. I want you to imagine that I come up, I take your watch off of your wrist, I put it on the floor, the watch that your great-great-great-grandmother gave you, and I start jumping up and down on it. I break it into a billion pieces. You're sitting there, my watch, my family heirloom. I can't believe it. I finally finish my fit of rage and I look at you and you're, there's tears running down your face. How am I going to face my family? What am I going to tell my mother? Why'd you do this? I feel so guilty. 
Let's change the scenario. Let's say I take my own watch off. I throw it on the floor and I jump up and down on my own watch. And it breaks into a million pieces. And now I finish jumping up and down. I look down on the floor, my watch is broken into a million pieces. Do I feel guilty? No. I might feel regret. I don't feel guilty. Guilt is when you do something to somebody else. Regret is when you do something to yourself. So we think that Jewish guilt is what's called for on the Yom Yom in the process of El. I feel so guilty as to what I've done. You haven't done anything to God. You can't affect him or her or it. You can't. You cannot change, add to, or subtract from an infinite being. It's mathematically impossible. Don't feel guilt. But regret. Lulay. If only. If only I didn't lose my temper. What would my marriage look like? If only I wasn't so cynical. Maybe, maybe my relationships would be a little bit better. If only I didn't have such a problem with self-confidence. Maybe the first second I sat down with somebody else, we wouldn't have to speak about somebody else so that I could feel better about me. Lule, what would the world look like? I remember traveling, I just came back from South Africa, I was in Soweto with a group of students. But a few years ago, it's Southwest Township. It's an area in Johannesburg. No problem. You should never be ashamed or embarrassed to just ask out loud. I always teach my students that the only silly or stupid question is the one that you haven't asked. So I went to Soweto, this township area. Everyone's living in the most insane poverty ever. Houses are made out of corrugated steel, tied together with wire. That's what the house looks like. A young boy took us by hand and wanted to show us where he sleeps. He walks into the house and he points into the corner at a coffin that has a pillow at the top and a blanket on. He says, look, and I said, you sleep on the coffin? And he's laughing at me, he says, no, stupid. I don't sleep on the coffin. He's like, oh, Baruch Hashem, must be just his great dead grandfather, you know? So I walk in. And he picks up the lid of the coffin, and inside the coffin is another pillow and blanket. He says, my older brother sleeps on the coffin. I sleep in the coffin. There's holes drilled in the side for air. This is what some people in the world call bunk beds. Lule, so I went to Soweto. I just see God, you just so you get what I'm saying. And we're walking down, and there's these paths in between the houses that, <laughs> Funnily enough, they call streets. And as they're sitting there walking, there's water running down, and someone says to us, don't walk in it, because it's not water. It's sewage running down the street. And all of a sudden, this girl walks up, a beautiful little African girl, and she's wearing pink fluffy slippers. And I took a picture of these pink fluffy slippers, one of the most precious possessions I have. Because she's standing in the sewage, in pink fluffy slippers. One of the things about pink fluffy slippers is they don't have leather bottoms or welly, welly bottoms, they have fluffy bottoms. So she's standing in sewage, in pink slippers. And I remember it was so much, like many of you just did, try to imagine it in the real, and I just turned my head away, I couldn't look at it anymore. And as I turned my head away from the slippers, I saw, I caught a glimpse of a giant billboard where they were selling, obviously selling something. What do you think they were advertising on this billboard? Not a toilet, or sponges, or toilet paper. They were selling a drop top 500 SEL Mercedes Benz. So in my brain, there was a disconnect. And I'm sitting there, I went, I said, no, that can't be right. And then I looked back down, and I see the slippers, and, and then I'll put there, and, and that's when I realized this is a little lule. There's enough money in the world to solve poverty. There is. But we're too greedy for that. We need to have another iPad before someone else has a sandwich. Lule. 
What would the world look like if we were a little bit less selfish? What would our lives look like? Hashem is waiting for His world to be perfected, and we're going to get there, and we're going to dive in with our sin, and we're going to pick it up on Rosh Hashanah, and if we're a woman, of course, we're going to do the woman version of davening. Men will just daven, and women will do the woman version, which is, I'm not really sure what that is, unless every woman that I've seen doing that is really short-sighted, but either way, they'll pull it out, and they'll say, Uvchein. Uvchein. And, and we'll talk and we'll paint a picture of the Asukula Maguda Echos. How the entire world, all of humanity will come together to create a world in the image of Hashem, a world of kindness. And we'll dive in. I want you to think about pink fluffy slippers. And I promise you, you don't have to go to Africa to find it. It exists in the Jewish community. I know it exists in London because we're associated with a group called GIFT. I know it exists here in New York. You just have to find it because people are embarrassed. They're too ashamed to admit it. They're too nervous about what that's going to mean for Shidduchim. Will the other children get married if the secret is out that they can't have a wedding in the world of Astoria? Hearing the stories of people crying to me that they mortgaged their homes to be able to perform, to be able to show the wedding that they're supposed to show. It's so sad. But you are either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. You're either the person who's pushing this agenda or you're the person that's telling people by your actions that it's okay and that that's not so important. Are you the problem or are you the solution? Are you the El or are you the Lule? In the davening we say, My said voracious, this is the day, the day of the creation of the world. This is the day that all, every single living thing will come in front of you, Hashem, and be judged. Is it worthy of a place? Is it worthy of more? Is it? My sibiracious, your creations, not human beings, the animals, they, they sit and they shiver from in front of you. The Malvim says, if an animal if an animal is not a Baal Bechira, what is the animal afraid of on Rosh Hashanah? It hadn't made a choice of good versus evil. What is the animal afraid of? And the Malvim says something. It's so beautiful. The Gemara tells us that if a person did not receive the Torah, if the Jewish people had not got the Torah on Har Sinai, Lech El Namola Otzel says the Pasa, go see the ant. See how it works with such alacrity. See Zerizos from the ant. Learn Tzinius, says the Gemara, from the cat. Go to each one of these animals and learn the Mida that I implanted in it. Like the Mishnah in Avos. As Kanema, you could learn from the leopard how to be brazen. You could learn from the eagle to be cow to soar, so I learn how to be what to be. Says the Malbin. But every animal in the world knows that the Torah has been given. Every animal in the world knows, like the Medrash explains that when Hashem gave the Torah, a single bird did not chirp. They know that the Torah is here, and they realize that they are now superfluous. What's my place in this world? What value do I add to the corporation that you should keep me on and not give me a pink slip? So the ants and the lions and the leopards and the sabus and the kudus and the, and the gazelles are frightened on Rosh Hashanah because they're superfluous. Are we superfluous? Does the world need us? And if it doesn't, then we have 40 days to make ourselves indispensable.
The Swarms say that one of the greatest things that a person can do for his chances and his family's chances, or her and her family's chances, is make themselves indispensable. Because in Judaism, that's not life and death. And I want to talk to you about this. We're petrified about getting written in the Sefer HaChayim or the Sefer HaMesim. In the Book of Life or in the Book of Death. But I think so many people get this wrong. It's not just life or death. How many living people do you know? How many living kids, students do I meet? They just want to check out. Two o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call from a 12-year-old girl asking me to tell her why she shouldn't slit her wrists. Tell me why I should stay around. They are walking zombies whose greatest color, the worst thing that could happen to them in their lives is if Hashem would give them a bit more time. It's the thing they want the least. They daven to get out of a world of pain, of judgment. That's all they want, they just want to leave. Sifri Chaim, Sifri Mason, it doesn't mean that I have a pulse and it is brain activity on a monitor. It means that my life is something that I want. That I don't need to go on countless vacations because my life is so dreadful that if I can't run away from it long enough, I can't manage. If at the end of your vacation you don't want to go home, isn't it time for a change? Isn't it time for a change? If only you'd feel so energized. Yeah, you might need rest. You might need a change of pace. But that your job or your family or your community is something that you feel energized, excited about. That you are indispensable. People need you. Not because you need the power of people needing you. But so that at the end, at the end of a person's life, they can put their head down on their pillow and go with a smile on their face. Because it was worth me coming. It was worth me coming. It was worth my struggle. In Judaism, life is not a right. Living is not a right. It's a privilege. <laughs> It's a privilege that's granted to a person because they're supposed to do something with it. I had a friend who became very, very ill. No one knew what it was. They thought it was viral arthritis. He can't move. His arms, his legs, young guy, he just got married. It's a viral arthritis, but it doesn't go. This is a boy who plays basketball, who used to run around, was very excited. And finally a doctor tells him, I need you to go check, I want you to do this specific blood test. And the words that he's dreaded, because it's in the back of people's heads when things are wrong, the words come through and they tell him that you have a very aggressive form of Yerimachla. Six months he's now. Rush into the hospital. It's unbelievable. And the process that some of you will know, my own sister, when she was a young girl, had leukemia. I, my childhood was spent in hospitals. And I was so young, I didn't understand. It was fun. I would go, we didn't have a TV at home, so, yeah, you want to the hospital. Score. I could watch a Disney. Yeah. I didn't, I was too young. But he fights, and he fights, and he fights. And finally, the news comes through. The results that they're waiting for, that he's free and clear. So all of us friends, we go out, we have the celebration like you can't imagine. Party. And then he comes home. And he walks into his apartment. 
and there's a light flashing on his answering machine. And he goes to the answering machine, he pushes the button, and the doctor says, we're so, so, so sorry, but we've read the results wrong, and you need to come back to the hospital. You know what it feels like to have the rug yanked out from under your feet. And we begin again. And it drained him so much, I didn't even have money. He didn't have money to take a cab. He used to have to take public transport, get on a bus to go to the hospital. They asked him if he would like to preserve his ability to have children, and he had to decide with his wife. They didn't have enough money to do it. Do you understand that that should be your cheshben? Finally, the nightmare is over. And he moves to a new community, and he gets a new job, and he starts making money. And I call him up, and I'm very, very close with him. We're very, very open. He says to me, he says, Shlomo, you know, I, he said that that was my wife's birthday. You know how much trouble we had with money. He said, I just bought her a pair of $4,000 earrings. And I said to him, change his name, I said, Duffin. I said, did you buy her those earrings because you're afraid you were going to die? You were afraid you were going to die? And listen to this. This is Rosh Hashanah. He says to me, no, I'm not afraid of dying anymore. Yeah, make my peace. I've been living in the zone for so long. It's normal. It's not. I said to them, he said, I'm not afraid of dying. He says, but I'm petrified of not living. You have a day today. What are you going to do with it? Was today, was waking up today, was it worth it? Hashem granted you a day today. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with tomorrow? Let's make a plan. That's Rosh Hashanah. Let's make a plan. I want a year. Hashem, this is what I'm going to do with my year. It might take me a little bit of time, but I'm going to make sure that I set this up, that I start collecting money for that, that I daven for this, that I'm more patient with the child that knows exactly how to push my buttons, that I'm kinder to my husband when he makes a mistake. And I don't do what all women seem to do. When you're upset or angry and your husband says, well, what is it? And you say to him, well, you don't know by yourself? <laughs> Be kind. We're stupid. <laughs> what are we going to do with our lives? In Tefillah it says, Chaim Shel Shalom. Chaim Shel Baracha. And I often notice that there's two different expressions that we use. One is Chaim Sheyesh Bohem, and one is Chaim Shell. What's the difference in Lush and Kaddish between those two things? Chaim Sheyesh Bohem is a life that has in it Parnasa, Bracha, Taira, children, everything that you could possibly need, health. A life that has in it Chaim Shell Bracha, Chaim Shell Parnasa. It's not a life that has in it. It's an adjective describing the life. When we're asking Hashem for life, I don't want a pulse. I want much more than that. I want to live and I want to matter. I want to be proud of my accomplishments. Fashion is beautiful. I love shopping too. Nice car, luxury, beautiful house, and vacation. Beautiful, amazing. But could you imagine going to a restaurant and ordering the most amazing meat and all they bring you on the plate is gravy? You walk out of the restaurant in indignation. So we come to our Baruch Hu with a waiter and we're putting it down. Look, let me show you this wonderful dish that I prepared for you. Here you go and all it is is gravy. And the scary thing is that gravy is not just the extra luxuries of life, but gravy is also a person's mitzvahs when they're not doing what they need to be doing. Famous question that they ask. We say in davening, Take the satan away from in front of us and from behind us. Now, everyone always answers, why do I need the satan away from in front of me? Understood, they're blocking me. But the satan that I've passed already on the highway, 
Why do I care about him? My Rebbe explained to me, he said, there's a person who's supposed to be learning Be'il, and they're supposed to be learning a Blat Gemara in depth. They're supposed to sit on this project that they're currently in. But the Yitzhahara tells them, he knows he's not going to get you by telling you, leave the daf, turn on the telly. So he tells you, you need to hurry up. There's another daf. Turn the page. The Yitzhahara wants you to do anything, even a mitzvah, other than the one you're supposed to be doing now. If I have a challenge in my life, that that's what I was born to overcome, a born to accomplish, the Yitzhahara is very happy for you to initiate a chesed organization. As long as you don't do what you came here to do. And that's what we ask for when we ask for Chaim, we ask for life. There's a beautiful halacha. There's no maximum size for a shir, for a shofar. And anyone who's ever been to the Kaisa will know that that maximum shir gets flaunted as much as they can. The bigger your shofar is, the more excited you are. But there is a minimum shir for a shofar. The minimum shir for a shofar is that it has to be bigger than the tefach. It has to exist in your hand. It needs to be seen on either side of your fingers when you're blowing it. And I once heard an amazing shot. There's no size for the shofar, but it needs to be seen in your hand. Chazal tell us that the hand of a person represents their actions. So we go to shear after shear. We have something in the car. We're inspired. But if you can't see the shofar in your hand, if it's not visible that you're trying to do something, then what do you have? The maximum shear, we're not worried about. But at the very least, walk away from these situations in your life when you're inspired, when you realize that there's more to live for, when you see a role model, someone that wakes you up, make sure that it's visible, the inspiration that you've had. Now, you're not allowed to blow a shoifer backwards. Does anyone know that? If I decided that I want to blow the back end of the shoifer, the big wide part, I'm not allowed to blow it. I have to blow it from the small part at the bottom. And even if I were to manipulate the shoifer with heat to try and make the top part a little bit smaller, I'm not allowed to do that. It is a beautiful explanation which applies so much to our efforts with regards to regret. And that is that when a person sits on one side of the ocean of Teshuvah, when they examine and, admi and admire the person that they could be, and they look at the person that they are, the chasm is so big that we're tempted sometimes not to even start. And the shoifah itself inherently teaches us that all that you put out is this tiny little breath. It's a small hole, usually not even the size of a pencil. And the top of the shayfa widens out. HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes your effort and he turns it into something magnificent, something beautiful, something life-changing. But if we were to blow the shayfa backwards, showing and indicating that what was needed from a person was this great, giant hole, then maybe we wouldn't do anything. So today, on Rosh Chodesh El, know that you have 40 days. 40 days that take you from one side to the other. 40 days that in Chazal always represents the concept of rebirth, of renewal. The 40 saw of a mikvah disconnects the person from the world and the person that they were before and transforms them into a person who is pure, who is different. The 40 days of the model is a giant mikvah for the entire world, a renewal, a rebirth, and the 40 days of El till Yom Kippur is a giant mikvah an opportunity to be reborn, an opportunity to change all of those little foibles, little mistakes that you have into the most incredible strengths. If you're pedantic, that means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made you good at details. If you're cynical and you don't have a microphone that works, <laughs> 
if you are cynical, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu made you that way so that you could be a person who evaluates their own mistakes. Let's stop looking at our negative sides as only negative and recognize that those things were given to us so that we could use them in a positive way. Let's be reborn. Let's use our 40 days to become the person that we could be. Because suddenly, when a person understands that that's all HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants, then it's not so frightening. See, we look at the concept of din, and we think that din is very scary, correct? Being judged is very scary. We don't want din. What are we daven for? We daven that Hashem should give us? Rachamim. Mistake. Come on, why? So imagine a child who spends days, weeks, months working on the most amazing report on the most amazing essay, and they put their heart, their blood, their soul, their tears into this report. And they walk in after it's finished. They're so proud of their work, and they take the report, and they walk in, and they put it on the desk in front of the teacher. I know I've done this myself. I wrote a book report I was very, very proud of. Sat there, I even drew on the cover, right? Sat to put it on the thing, you know? I don't know about the Nobel Peace Prize, but something I was going to get for this one. You know, I'm very excited. People came, they put their book reports on top. I kind of switched it back and hold it again, <laughs> right? Saying so this is just, <laughs> you might want to read that, you know, when uh, you have, you know, just a nice drink. You might hear, this is maybe, I don't know, maybe you can even build your vacation time around. Anyway, so I'm sitting there thinking that this is the most amazing thing ever. So the child walks in, he puts it, and the teacher says, thank you guys for your book reports. That was just practice. I just wanted to teach you guys how to write a book report, and he throws them all in the trash can. <laughs> That wasn't exactly what happened to me. What happened to me was worse. <laughs> I'll share it later if anyone in group therapy or something. <laughs> so, so the teacher's taking throw it, and the kid goes, no, I'm sorry. I practice. And all of the other kids are sitting there, and they're saying, oh, thank God. But the kid, the kid who put the effort in, takes the thing out, and he says, no. He slams on the table, and he says, mark my paper. Is there anything more terrifying than thinking about a world in which what you did, in the things that you sweat for, the chinuch that you gave to your children, the tzedakah that you gave, is not judged? Is there anything worse than thinking, anything worse than thinking that I've got a spark who just doesn't care? Is this the game? Rachamim is not what we want. We want Rachamim in the din. So this Rosh Hashanah, let's come to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Let's think about and talk to him about the wonderful things that we've done and admit that we could have done them a little bit better. Let's drop our plan so that when we present our plan, we are scribbled in it. It's like in the Senate. You want something in your district built, you get a very important bill, and you stick in the pork, pardon the non-Jewish expression, in the bill, and then the president looks at the great good that the bill has, and he sees something which is maybe not as good as, but still a positive thing, and he says, fine. This is my part. This is my part. This is how I'm going to be better. This is how I'm going to contribute to a world. And then Hashem gives you, he gives you what you need. Because you don't want it for you. Now, I'd like to just end with this. A story that for me was very, very, very inspiring. It's amazing, this little watch here built into the stender. I don't know if you guys have seen that. You guys seen this little watch built into the stender? Yeah, it's very, very, I was thinking, wow, this is Lawrence. <laughs> it's fantastic, you know? Built into the stender. It's a beautiful watch. I was thinking I have to literally steal the stender at the end. And I was thinking I'm giving a shit about Rosh Hashanah. I'm thinking of stealing the stender. But then I realized that Rosh Hashanah went on, I'm going to have to steal the stender. You know why? Because this watch is stopped, which means I have a perennial another 15 minutes. <laughs> Greatest gift a speaker could ever have, ever. Now, I don't really have 15 more minutes, but I'd like to just end with this story. A little child, her name is Jenny. Jenny loves to dress up. I remember taking my girls to Toys R Us. 
And the older ones, they want the, the game, they want this, they want that. And my younger one, she just wanted the princess dress with the wand, you know, with the things. And, and you know, so Jenny, she just went. And one day she's walking past the toy store and she sees in the window of the toy store, she sees these beautiful plastic pearls. They're big, white. She wants to look like a mommy. These were, how regal would that make my princess dress look like? And she asks, and she asks, and she asks, until finally her father buys her the pearls, and it's her favorite possession. And a year goes by, and two years go by, and dad walks in one night, and he says, Jenny, he says, Jenny, can I ask you a favor? And she says, okay, sure, whatever you want. And daddy says, you know, would you mind, would you mind giving me your pearls? And Jenny says, dad, silly dad, this is my favorite, this is my favorite toy. Here, why don't you have my little pony? You could brush the hair. And dad says, that's okay. I'm all right. He gives her a kiss. And he goes to sleep. And, they go, and the next day he comes in again. He says, Dad, Jenny, can I ask you a favor? She says, sure, Dad. He says, can I have your pearls? And she says, but Daddy, these are my favorite. Why don't you play with my Barbie dolls? And dad says, no, no, it's fine, really. And he gives her a kiss. And he walks out. And every day, again and again, Jenny, can I have the pearls? No. And she offers him another. And offers him another. And offers him another. Anything but the pearls. And then finally, one day, Dad walks into the room, and Jenny's sitting on her bed with a pensive look on her face. And she's crying. And Dad said, what's the matter, Jenny? And she says, every night you come in and you ask me for these, and I always tell you no. But you're the best daddy in the world. But they're my favorite toy. So I kept thinking about it and thinking about it until finally I decided, if that's what you want so much, then here, why don't you have my pearls? And of course, by now, the dad is crying as well. And he reaches into his back pocket. And he pulls out what's been sitting there for months, a black velvet case, and he opens it up, and inside is a real string of pearls. And he says, Jenny, I wanted to give you these for months. But I couldn't give them to you. I couldn't give you the real thing until you were willing to let go of the toy. Hashem turns up on our doorstep every Rosh Hashanah. And he wants to give us real life. But we're obsessed with the toys. And we kind of ask for the things that we have to because you think, you know what, if I'm not alive, I can't enjoy the toys. But it's really about the toys. And Hashem is just waiting. Please, just give, just give it up. Remember us for life. We only want to live it for real life, for truth. For the sake that life was invented for in the first place. Here, have the stupid toys. What would you give? What would you give for your child to succeed, to be confident? What would you give for your kids who are not married to be married? What would you give to be able to have children if you can't? You give anything, anything. Let's stop and think for ourselves about the things that make up what real life is about. And try and focus and think in our heads that if that's what it is, if that's reality, then does my life mirror a search for reality or a search for toys? Teshuvah means to repent. It means to go back to the way it was. What were you when you were a baby? You were someone who knew that all it needed to live was love. It needed food. It needed family. That's what it needed. Teshuvah means to go back to forget the world's definitions of what a life is and to try and remember Torah's definitions. Try to remember God's definitions. Try to remember what our own definitions would be if we weren't constantly bombarded with the message of toys. May HaKadosh Baruch see our innate and real desire for change a change that is only really a change back to what we were. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu see the inherent value that he put inside of us becoming latent, becoming used. 
May we never again see ourselves as small, insignificant, toy-playing children and see ourselves as the people who are capable of moving mountains, of changing worlds, of repairing lives, of fixing families, of creating places of learning Torah, of creating yeshivas. This is what we were made to do, make God see that inside of us, not just in potential, but in actual. And slowly but surely, the world will move from a place of pain, a place of imperfection, to the world that Hashem had in mind. Amen. A world with each and every one of us playing our part, being Misak and Oil of Malchashakai. And may Hashem be proud of our work and our efforts. I want to wish you an incredible Yom Yudayroim and a wonderful, wonderful Zachir of the day. because you just said don't play with toys, but I am. First of all, this is the first day of Rosh Chodesh Elo. I was going to bring a show for, but this is the second best thing. Remember, starting today, you could be everything. Rab, Rab Shlomo Farhi said it takes just a little bit of your breath. 40 days. And it's This is what you can create with a little bit of bread, with a little bit of effort, you can make a big difference. You can make the whole world the first one.